This is the American Law Journal. It was the pitch of the early 2000s. Anyone can be a homeowner. Easy loans, easy money. But when it came time to pay the piper, many couldn't. And now scores of homes are underwater. And here's the shocker. Even if you declare bankruptcy or foreclose on your house, don't expect your bank to take back your home. Now what? Good evening, I'm Christopher Naughton. This is ALJ. Underwater, the wave of foreclosure and bankruptcy. Many states are in hot water, but neighboring New Jersey now leads the nation in foreclosure rates. The impact is pretty much the same across the nation. And guess who's left holding the bag? You, the consumer. Desiree Taylor with NJTV News has this. When John Party purchased this home 10 years ago, he planned to build equity and memories. But that's all in jeopardy now because he faces foreclosure. Party's trying not to panic. When the day comes when I lose my home, uh, I'm sure I won't feel quite as calm. Yeah, if and when I lose the home. Party is among thousands of homeowners in the Garden State facing foreclosure. In fact, New Jersey now leads the nation. Close to 12 percent of mortgages in the state are more than 90 days delinquent. Florida's a close second at 11.7 percent. New York, 9.11 percent. The United States as a whole, more than 5 percent. New Jersey lags in part because it requires foreclosure cases to go to court. The reason is that uh, New Jersey has been stricter than any other state in terms of uh, preventing foreclosure actions from going forward. And so the result of that is that because other states have been clearing out their foreclosure backlog and New Jersey has not, what we're left with is a greater number of pending foreclosures. But lenders are now addressing the backlog at a faster rate. The foreclosure crisis is hitting some communities harder than others, among them urban areas and towns devastated by Superstorm Sandy. Because foreclosures also impact neighborhoods, there's been growing support in Trenton for a bill that would empower municipalities to compel creditors to maintain vacant properties. Some municipalities are also considering using eminent domain to seize underwater mortgages, but getting the funding could be a roadblock. It does not seem that adequate funding exists for that to happen on any large enough scale to make a difference. A tow expects it will take about 18 months for the foreclosure numbers to come down to single-digit normal levels. In the meantime, Party says he will continue to fight to keep his home. In Edison, I'm Desiree Taylor, NJTV News. All right, uh, three guests with me this evening. Let's go ahead and meet them. John DiGiambardino joins us tonight from Case DiGiambardino and Lutz, a debtor's firm. In bankruptcy 7, 11, and 13 matters. John in practice now over 25 years. The Honorable Richard Failing steps up to the plate for his second time. Former creditor's attorney at Stevens and Lee, a current triathlete from what I understand, a bankruptcy judge in Reading, Pennsylvania, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. We're always happy to have Tim Dugan here because he can give punches just as good as he takes them. Tim Dugan from Stark and Stark, our creditor's attorney tonight, uh, recently was featured in the Newark Star Ledger, an article dealing with this very issue tonight, and eminent, eminent domain. 1-800-426-4625 is the number right here in the studio. If you don't call in early, we will not get to your question. It's that simple. Or write us at info at lawjournaltv.com and we'll try our best to get your question in tonight. So I know that things have gotten better in the foreclosure market. You know, numbers are starting to inch down a little bit, but let's face it, this foreclosure, this bankruptcy cycle was property driven. It was a beast. And we probably have lenders, government, and consumers who brought on this travesty. We, I mean, use whatever me metaphor you'd like. Uh, it's, it's uh, <laughs> devil, pay the devil is due, the chickens have come home to roost. The wages of sin are death, or is death. Here we are. It's pretty bad. Who brought us here? Well, I think there's a, a plenty of blame to go around. Everything from the government to the banks to Wall Street and to uh, consumers who purchased homes that they couldn't afford. So when you look at it, um, there's plenty of blame to go around. The hard part is coming up with a solution that will enable us to move on. Um, some people believe it's moving this inventory through, putting it on the market. Other people are looking towards the bank and the government to do a small bailout of the individual homeowners. Right. I think that's where the problem is. Well, Judge, uh, and again, we won't get you involved in anything political, Judge. You know that. We're real careful with that. But let's face it, this bankruptcy cycle is more property driven than probably any bankruptcy cycle we've certainly seen in your practice lifetimes here on the set and with you as well as a creditor's attorney and now as a judge. Cer certainly for the consumers, yes. 
Right. So, and, and we wouldn't be in this position unless the fact that people in the early 2000s got homes that they really didn't deserve or they couldn't afford. That's true. And the cause of how they got into that position usually escapes me because they come to me once they're in problems. They come to the court, they file their bankruptcy. Uh, once they have the problem already, the cause of it, again, Tim, Tim is spot on. It, it really, across the panoply of, of uh, consumer uh, finance, banks, uh, government, the individuals, the borrowers, every one of them has a piece of the responsibility for getting to this point. Well, I, the way I look at it, there, there are really three ways that the consumer has and is getting nailed here. Number one, banks and lenders got people into loans and houses they could not afford. They inter interested them in, in some very unique candy, interest-free loans, adjustable mortgages. Then, before those adjustable <coughs> mortgages started going up in rate, the banks got Congress to pass the Bankruptcy Act of 2005, which had words some, to the effect Consumer Protection Act. Very Orwellian, had nothing to do with consumer protection whatsoever. So people who now couldn't make the payments on their houses, they were told, uh, guess what, Chapter 7 ain't so easy. And nowadays we're seeing the trifecta of doom here. Banks are refusing to take back houses. What's going on here, John? Well, the whole issue is, is very interesting. The, uh, let me just weigh in on this issue of the, the BAPSIPA, the 2005 Act. I don't really believe that had anything to do with what we're seeing today because those people who rushed to file their cases before 2005 were people who had unsecured debt problems. They, they weren't the secured debt problems that we see with these, with these mortgage issues. Today, what we have is a, a whole group of people who are now um, in a situation where they can't afford their mortgage. It doesn't make sense for them to pay their mortgage because they're so far underwater. Th the system doesn't give them the tools to solve the problem and the, the bank, the lender, has appears, it seems, very little incentive to resolve it in a way that would suit both the consumer and, I think, the well, community well, as a whole. Well, what, el what else is new? Now, it's true that that Consumer Protection Act, that Bankruptcy Act of 2005, it was designed, if you will, quote unquote, to screw the consumer. It was designed to put them in a noose. As it turned out, it really didn't, Tim. We've discussed this before. As it turned out, the banks, some of your, creditor, or your credit card banks, they lost out. <clears throat> when it came to mortgages, they lost out. I think some of the lenders who were involved in, let's say, auto loans, they did okay, but that act was designed to get at the consumer it never really did. Yeah, I don't think it did a whole lot uh, f uh, for anybody. I, I believe you can find ways to get into the Chapter 7 if you want to. The real problem is is the, the limitations on a uh, Chapter 13 in terms of how you deal with the mortgage. You cannot cram them down generally to the value of the home. So the most you can do is pay your back stuff, your rears over five years while making the regular payment. But if you can't make the regular payment, you have no shot of making the back payment. So you're stuck. And right now, one of the real problems we're seeing is as you lose your home, you have to go out in the rental market. And it's very difficult to find affordable housing right now in the rental okay. market. Right. Um, and, and we found that people, where am I going to go? I'm going to go out and look. I have children in the school district. I don't want to leave the town. Mm -hmm. But the alternatives aren't that good. But the Chapter 13 doesn't work for them, and there's really no way to force a bank to reduce the principal balance. Okay, good. And we've talked about loan mod modifications before and that sort of thing. But, John, what we're seeing now is unprecedented. We're seeing instances where people are foreclosing, they're filing for bankruptcy, and they feel like, well, I'm scot-free. This is a fresh start for me. And they're being told, no, 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 not so fast. Uh, the bank is not taking your house back. This is a pretty, a relatively new event in the history of bankruptcy, is it not? Well, we've, we've seen some of it in, in other markets some in, of in the past, but right. not to the extent that we're seeing it now. Right. Uh, we have lenders who literally go to the, they may even file a foreclosure and do nothing with the foreclosure judgment on a good day. Uh, sometimes they take the, uh, they, they don't even file the foreclosure at all. In the meantime, debtor having filed a bankruptcy thinks, I have a discharge, the property is, is off my plate, I don't have to worry about it. In the meantime, if you have a city property, you may have 
uh, violations, the code violations, you may have maintenance issues. Taxes. You know, taxes, sewage, your water and sewer. The, municipalities, right. And those so when you're are all post-petition debts, so by the way. Let's say you're sitting, I'm, I'm sitting across from you in, in your office and go, okay, you know, uh, Attorney D. Jambardino, I'm going to cash in my chips. It's all I can take and I can't take anymore. So foreclose on the house, we'll foreclose on the house, I'm going to file a bankruptcy. I start anew. And what do you have to tell them? Well, the first thing that I tell them is, we have to be careful, we have to think this through because what you think is going to happen will not happen exactly the way you like it. Yes, we can eliminate your personal liability on the debt, but you will still own the property and unless we can get the bank to take this property in some fashion, you're going to still own it. Judge, does the court get involved in this? I mean, again, you're starting to see this, obviously. You probably hadn't seen this when you were a creditor's attorney going back before 06. You're seeing it on the bench now. How does this come up in a court of law and bankruptcy? It comes up a couple different ways. Uh, it, it comes up through an attempt by uh, a debtor in bankruptcy to sell their home on a short sale. And there are, for a lot of different reasons, difficulties in doing that. Uh, uh, lately, the, the last year and a half to two years or so, there's been some loosening of some of the case law along those lines, and uh, it's gotten a little bit easier. It's still very difficult. Um, that's one of the things they can do. Uh, again, when you have a lawyer like John that you go to, he tells you, you got to be careful about this, and merely because you check off the box saying you want to abandon your home back to the, uh, to the creditor, that doesn't necessarily make it so. And don't you think the debtor, again, as, as maybe they're not as informed or as educated as this, as certainly as attorneys or creditors are, don't you think that they are in you know, stunned amazement when they find out, gee, I can't even give my house back even though I'm filing for bankruptcy, it's foreclosed? Yeah, I, I think they are. Are they incredulous? I think they're surprised by that. And it's exacerbated by, when I talk about, you know, uh, talking to a, a lawyer like John and who knows what he's doing, there are a huge number of an uptick in the number of pro se filings where debtors think representing I'm, themselves I'm, they're I'm representing save, themselves yeah I'm gonna save 700 bucks or thousand dollars whatever it is and I'm gonna file this myself and I can do that and they file a chapter 7 they don't know what they're doing and they end up with still owning the property with all again as, as you said with all the concomitant uh, additional expenses year to year to year if the bank doesn't take it back real estate taxes uh, sewage uh, fees, water fees, all that kind of stuff, they're responsible for it. Right, and they may be responsible for squatters or, un, uh, you know, uh, occupants, unauthorized occupants, uh, the homeless. Uh, there, there's a, certainly a legal liability there. There's an exposure there. There, there is also, I mean, if they, they can't pay the mortgage, they're probably not paying real estate insurance. And if somebody trips and falls or has some sort of a problem, uh, somebody gets hurt on their property, they have the exposure with no insurance coverage. Here's our first email of the night. It comes from uh, George in Philadelphia. They say bankruptcy is a fresh start, but how can I have a fresh start with federal and state back taxes? And now the bank is saying it does not want to take possession of my home, even though initially they said they did. God, John, that's got to be heartbreaking if you get that question. I mean, we're getting it tonight on the program. It's got to be heartbreaking when you get that in your, in your office. Because even a good attorney like yourself or your partners, sometimes you can't wave a magic wand. There are tactics, if you will, where we can attempt to negotiate something with a, with a creditor. Uh, there is a, a First Circuit case where a, uh, a debtor tried to use the contempt powers of the court to force a creditor to take a home. They were unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. um, we mentioned uh, earlier that there was that there were communities using eminent domain or attempting to use right. eminent domain as a yes. power, but ultimately, um, if you're in a Chapter Seven case, a case where uh, that is not a debtor in possession case, you have very little to say about how that right. case, how that house. Right. Uh, so no matter how good an side. attorney John might be, Tim, you're going to tell him, sorry, there's really nothing you can do here. A lot of times that's the case, and it comes down to a timing issue, because oftentimes you can wait for the sheriff's sale, but not always. Um, you know, there may be a wage execution, another reason why you have to file bankruptcy. And, uh, and it's uh, also problematic for condominiums and homeowners. One of the exceptions to the bankruptcy discharge is post-bankruptcy condominium fees. You're liable for those until you, you, the, you lose title to the property. 
So even if you walk away and feel there's minimal obligation for maintenance or you know to the local municipality you're still going to have the condominium so right. at least in new jersey though they are taking i think there's some legislative steps and i think a few states have done this i think Connecticut's one of them where they basically said okay stop banks someone if the house is foreclosed upon someone declares bankruptcy you must take ownership of that or take possession of that property in other words we're not going to allow you to refuse to take that property from the debtor yeah, I, th I think there's going to be some significant constitutional challenges to that. I think now you could probably get them to advance and potentially maintain the property, but I don't know if you can force them to exercise their contractual rights to take the property um, as opposed to coming in the court and trying to come up with an argument of why that mortgage should be discharged uh, if you're not enforcing your rights. But I, I, I don't see how you can do that, um, force them to proceed to take title when there may be a variety of reasons, environmental issues, um, whether or not there's enough equity in it, uh, the property to make it worthwhile going through the process, especially when the states have created part of the problem by making it so long to get through a foreclosure process. The Chris, part of the me, prop, Chris, go ahead, sorry. Judge. Let me jump in we'll on get that. get back there, to you, John. Because there are some, uh, some bankruptcy judges that will not grant relief from the automatic stay unless the bank, lender, whatever, says they're going to exercise their rights right away. Um, I, I don't see any, I don't do that. I don't see any provision for that in the bankruptcy code, but I know that there are some uh, of my brethren and sisters that are, that are doing that. Let's go to uh, Tom from Reading uh, first tonight. Uh, again, 1-800-426-4625 is the number right here in the studio. In fact, we'll take your phone calls a few minutes after the 730 mark. Even after we're off the air, we'll stick around in the studio for a few minutes. Tom from Reading, you're up first tonight. What's your question for us? Tom, uh, I have a question. Last year I had to go through bankruptcy in order to save my home, and then I have a trustee payment plus the mortgage. My situation changed again as far as my income. I got hurt at work. I'm on a workman's comp. I ended up getting fired from my job. Now the lawyer takes 20% of my money. I find it hard to pay the almost 800 a month to the trustee and the 1600 a month to the for the mortgage trying to keep everything going to keep my home is there a way that i could refinance everything together and just have a regular monthly payment and then pay off the trustee is, is there loans out there that are offered that because i do have a settlement down the road coming and i do have guaranteed income with my fiance but i'm, I'm just wondering would this be is is this something that's out there offered by the government or someone I see a lot of grimaces out of the, my peripheral vision here. Mm -hmm. John, Tim. Well, we, first, what he's described initially, at least within the bankruptcy system, is part of the restrictive nature of the Chapter 13 process. You can't take a mortgage and simply restructure it completely. There's uh, something called the anti-modification provision that says the only thing we could do with that first mortgage is take the arrears and put them into that five-year plan. The consequence to this gentleman is is that he now doesn't have the ability to continue his old mortgage payments and his his plan payment. The in theory we should have a procedure where whereby that that whole mortgage would be able to be modified mm -hmm. like we are able to do in a chapter 12 or a chapter 11 case. But in a third but the average consumer can't afford those cases or that kind of cases and isn't appropriate or, uh, for, the, for their situation. Uh, let's go to an email question here from JJ in Easton. I am currently three years into a Chapter 13 bankruptcy. As far as I know, my home is included in the bankruptcy. I make my mortgage payment to the bankruptcy department of the loan company. Is there any way to walk away from my house and let it go into foreclosure with it being in bankruptcy? I've already had a loan modification, as you mentioned a moment ago, John, to help financially, but I can no longer afford any mortgage. Well, I think first they have to go back and uh, talk to the bankruptcy lawyer to find out if there's other reasons why you're in bankruptcy, not just for the home. You're, there may be other uh, debts you have to pay, non-dischargeable debts, tax debts. Um, one of the options would be to sit down with your uh, lawyer and see whether you want to convert to a Chapter 7 um, to avoid the, um, the payments and also get your discharge. However, I do think it's crucial 
to sit down with your bankruptcy lawyer, do not make the decision yourself to see if there's other reasons why you're in a Chapter 13. Uh, going back to, again, the banks refusing to take the house back, one of the, the glimmers of light might be for those people who have some equity in their home, they're not going to cash out and, and go for a Chapter 7, they're going for Chapter 13. So this whole notion of vesting, John, what is it and how do you, <laughs> in, in a word or two, I see your eyes rolling, but in a word or two, what does it mean and, and how do you play ball with a creditor and creditor attorney or is it a game of chicanery you're just trying to slip it into the agreement and hopefully no one notices uh, it's a good question there um, there's a specific section of the bankruptcy code uh, whereby property that the debtor owns at the time he or she files her case becomes property of the estate meaning it's within the jurisdiction of the court when one files a chapter 13 confirmation of the plan returns that property to the to the debtor. Sometimes you can delay that process till the end of the case, but it, it generally happens at confirmation of the plan. We call that vesting or revesting. The provision that talks about revesting also says that property can not only revest in the debtor, but can be revested into a creditor. Right. Okay. Uh, at least one theory uh, people have discussed to solve this problem is they simply have the property vest into the secured creditor as part of your, well, your that confirmation would make, That would make plan. things easy for your clients. I obviously. don't know what that does though ultimately mm -hmm. because you still have the the title issue mm -hmm. and, and you'd have to be more creative in your language in your plan to get title ultimately to pass to the mm -hmm. uh, to the creditor. Judge, uh, we never used to see people walking away from their homes. You rarely saw that. But again, part of this property-driven bankruptcy cycle, the term walking away has become an idiom and a phrase unto itself. It has, and uh, you see that in a number of the cases where that's what they want, that's where a debtor wants to do. And again, it, they, they do it through a short sale, or they try to. They'll do it through any number of uh, mechanisms where they, they hope to be able to do that. The problem is, again, as John said, you, the problem is you, when you file, you don't have the right to walk away and have no more responsibility for your home. Uh, I used to have debtors attorneys on this program six, seven, eight, ten years ago who would say, no, 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 we don't recommend that. In fact, they, they acted sheepishly as if, you know, if we're not bre breaking a distinct actual law, it, it is an unwritten code. You just don't walk away from your home. You don't encourage someone to walk away from your home. Today, lawyers are encouraging people, walk away from your home. Well, it, it, to the contrary, I think some of them, and again, this, this, is, I understand. All, this is all uh, my understanding from speaking with lawyers at, at, at functions. To the contrary, a lot of lawyers are saying, look, stay in your home, don't pay your mortgage, they're not going to foreclose, or maybe they will, mm -hmm. but pay your Keep utilities up, keep the uh, sewage bills current, pay your, uh, your uh, real estate taxes, continue to make payments, don't make your mortgage, save your monthly mortgage payment, mm -hmm. and, and save up a, a little war chest for, as I think Tim said, uh, to, uh, to go to an apartment or some sort of a rental position where you've got a slug of money that you can put down as first month, last month, and whatever else they require of you because now you've got a bad credit record. But to the contrary, they're being told, don't walk away. God, well, Stay but, but, in there for, well, for free. <laughs> walk away from making the payments, but well, yes. be a squatter in your own home, because if you don't press the banks, they may not press you. And, and then you can save the money, as you say, yes. and, and maybe save it up for an apartment or something along and, those lines. And there are some new, again, as I understand it, because I've heard these related to me in court, there are some new programs by some lenders, if not all, in which they'll strike a deal with the current owner of the property, that as long as that owner does everything I said, that is they continue to make utility payments, they continue to live in there, they continue to, you know, if a window gets broken, they'll at least put something over it so it doesn't ruin the house. As, lo as long as they do that, the, the lender will let them stay in there without hassling them for some period of time. Yeah, you know, I've got a, a question I want to ask uh, Tim before we, we leave the, uh, the air tonight. Uh, in a domain, a, a number, and, and people who watch our program knows, know what that's all about. It's when the government takes property for public use. And a number, and you just went on record in the Newark Star-Ledger not that long ago, regarding this very issue. There are some cities, probably not just in New Jersey, where, again, the foreclosure rate is at an ungodly level, who want to basically 
purchase properties, gut them, get rid of them, and then the towns, or I guess it's the state, perhaps it's the feds, who pay for this eminent domain, basically taking over the properties. You said that this is not a great idea, Tim. Why not? What's interesting about this, and it started probably five or six years ago, a professor up at Cornell came up with the idea of acquiring the mortgage, not the real estate. So it wouldn't be an eminent domain where you come in and take the real estate. You would come in and acquire the mortgage. So Richmond, California got this program going. It was uh, challenged in court. It was ultimately dismissed because the case was filed too early. But what was interesting about that case is probably two-thirds of the mortgages in the portfolio that they were seeking to take were people that were current. They were not mortgages in default. And the idea being that if, a, if your mortgage is 300000 and your home is worth 200, they would try to acquire that mortgage for about $180,000. Then I would sell it to John for two hundred or one hundred and ninety-five, and he would recast it, and the bank would be left holding the bag. So the idea being is I could acquire it, I would sell it to John, John would pay me, I'd make a profit, then John would recast it at the value of the home. Right, but you're, you had a problem with this whole eminent yeah. domain problem uh, issue because people were being treated differently. Maybe someone by a park or by the water, their property would be, or their mortgages would be purchased, but maybe someone in the inner city, their properties would not be purchased. It's and kind of a disparate impact. It's a disparate impact, and two thirds of them were going to be current mortgages, people paying. So if you're, if, yeah, that's why I called it the, uh, the uh, eminent domain lottery, because if you're current on your mortgage and you are living paycheck to paycheck, Check, okay. you might get relief down the road. Someone in the same situation that doesn't qualify is not going to get to hit the lottery. In addition, I think there's going to be a huge litigation over what's the value of a mortgage that's being paid. Is it the face amount or is it a discounted amount? Eminent domain, it's uh, fair market value, whatever that is. What they would sell that uh, that mortgage on the marketplace, and we know that there's a secondary market for for these mortgages. I don't think it would be very difficult to value them. I well, you, when you have a portfolio of defaulted loans and current loans, that's where it gets different. Ah, uh, they do it all the time. Judge, you're going to get the last words tonight. Uh, do you think? And again, I know this is just conjecture, but it's not political. Do you think we've seen the worst? of this wave of foreclosures. What do you see in the courts that suggest that this might be so? I, I think um, maybe I'm just uh, optimistic, but I think, yes, the worst is over. I, the filings in bankruptcy are down double digits this year from last year, and they were down double digits okay. last year from the year before, and they right. were down double digits the year before from the year before that. So the number of filings is going down. Judge, I, thank you so much tonight. Unfortunately, they're sweeping us out of the studio. Continue huh. with your phone calls. Thank you for joining us. Don, John D. Giambarodino, Tim Dugan, and Judge Richard Failing on our program tonight. Thanks all one and all. We'll see you next week right here on the American Law Journal. Case closed. The journal has been made possible in part by Case, DG Ambarodino, and Lutz since 1984, providing their clients in southeastern Pennsylvania with professional and competent legal counsel in matters involving zoning and real estate development, debtor and creditor rights, and personal and corporate bankruptcy. Stark and Stark, developing innovative solutions to meet their clients' needs in bankruptcy and creditors' rights and in over 30 other service areas. And the Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers.